Nature Forward presents How to Build a Native Plant Rain Garden A step by step Start to finish Tutorial for Landscaping Professionals Like you With Alice Sturm and me, Gabriela Paola Franco Peña A rain garden made of native plants? This is going to be so fun! I'm so glad you could join us! Hi, I'm Gabriela Franco, a bilingual specialist for the garden programs at Nature Forward, connecting people in nature in the capital region. I'm here today at Nature Forward's Wooden Nature Sanctuary in Chevy Chase, Maryland, to show you how to install a native plant rain garden and to explain why you might want to. On rainy days in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, any water that falls on roads or rooftops or other impervious surfaces doesn't have the chance to soak into the ground. Instead, it becomes runoff that carries pollutants and sediment into storm drains and then into creeks. These pulses of fast-moving storm water then erode the banks of those creeks, sending sediment and pollutants downstream and ultimately toward the Chesapeake Bay. Here at Wooden Nature Sanctuary, we're installing rain gardens and conservation landscaping to slow down, spread out, and soak in storm water before it leaves the property. In this video, we will walk you through the process of constructing a simple rain garden and also show you an example of a conservation landscape. Ready to begin? Let's go! A rain garden is a garden in a shallow depression called a basin that collects storm water and helps it soak in. Deciding where a rain garden should be located is the first step in the design process. In our case, this area of the wooden sanctuary driveway, close to the entrance on Jones Mill Road, was the only impermeable surface on our property that still drained directly to the storm sewer. The lawn at the base of this portion of the driveway did not allow water to soak in very well. So, this was it the optimal place to locate our new rain garden. But before we could get to our design and installation, we had to think about one very important factor, infiltration. You see, water should only stay in the basin of a rain garden for about 24 hours. But if the soil has too much clay or is too compacted, water will stay longer than that. That's something we need to know so that we can speed the water along by adding gravel and drainage pipes if we need to. But how do we know if that's the case? Something called a percolation test is used to assess the situation. With more about the percolation test and the rain garden's design, here's Alice Storm, Garden Program's Manager at Nature Forward. Hello, I'm Alice Storm. Before creating a rain garden, a permeable pathway, or even planting any garden, learning whether the soil drains and how fast is very useful. The best way to do this is a percolation test. This shows you if water is able to soak into the soil. If the soil does not drain, most plants will not survive because their roots will not get enough oxygen, and your rain garden won't be much of a garden at all. It will be more like a pond, not what we want. To begin the percolation test, dig a hole. Try to dig at least 18 inches deep, below the first layer of the soil. Once you've dug the hole, wet it with a hose or a bucket of water. Next, secure a yardstick in the center of the hole and fill it with water. Make note of the level of the water. Check again after 15 minutes. What's the change in the water level? Now, multiply the change in water level by four and you have the percolation rate in inches per hour. A rate of a quarter inch per hour is a fine percolation rate for a normal garden, and it's the minimum rate you'd want for a rain garden. If it drains faster than that, then you want to make sure that you choose plants that are drought tolerant, because they will get dry quickly between rain events. If the rate is slower, choose plants that like wet conditions, and this may not be a suitable location for a rain garden without amending the soil and possibly adding drains underneath. Check back on your percolation test site over the next couple of days and you'll derive more information. If the water is still there after two days or even longer, 
then you might need to decompact the soil before installing plants. As, without modification, their roots may not get enough air to survive. In our case, the existing soil drained well, so we'll rely on topography and a few soil amendments to encourage the water to infiltrate. Now, a little more detail on the design of the rain garden. Let's look at the design drawings. In our rain garden design, runoff from the steep driveway is directed into the rain garden with a simple angled curb cut. From there, the water flows into the first basin. When that basin is completely full, water spills into a second, lower basin. Finally, if that basin fills completely, water spills onto a conservation landscape which is an area with a few shallow berms seeded with native grasses and some more native plants. The spillways between these different parts of the rain garden are lined with stone to prevent erosion. Our rain garden is designed to soak in most rain events, but we also wanted to account for bigger storms. Every stormwater practice needs to have an overflow, a place for the water to go if there is simply too much rain in too short a time for the rain garden to soak it all in. Where open space is limited, this overflow typically goes back into the traditional storm drain system. But in our case, we have the space to create a treatment train of practices and to direct overflow toward an open natural area. Thanks, Alice. With the design complete, the first step in constructing the rain garden is to lay out the paper design in real space, marking the locations of the curb cut, basin, spillways, and berms. Next, a silt fence is installed on the downhill side of the construction site to catch any sediment that washes down during construction. This fence will not be removed until the plants are fully established to cover the bare soil. Now, excavation can begin. Using the contour lines spray painted by the surveyors, the contractor uses the excavator to sculpt the depressions of the rain garden. This involves digging the basins deeper and building the sides higher. Rain garden designs try to balance cut and fill to minimize the amount of soil that needs to be hauled off site. When building up the berms, Contractors build up six inches at a time, then compact the soil before building up higher. The next step is to ensure good infiltration in the basins. This could involve installing drainage stone and piping. But in our case, this means digging six to eight inches deeper than the final elevation to break up compacted soils and incorporating leaf grow compost as Eric Ettenhofer of Lurch Brothers Landscape Contractors explains. So we put some compost in there. Uh, what we did was we took our excavator and we excavated down about one foot, kind of loosened that soil up at the bottom. Then we mixed in some leaf grow, tilled it in real nice, so we should get some good infiltration in the basins. Large rocks are placed anywhere the flow of water is concentrated. At the entrance, the narrow area connecting the two pools and again at the overflow out of the second lower pool. This helps avoid erosion, and the rough texture slows the water down. To minimize weeds growing in the rocks over time, landscape fabric is laid underneath. These are called the spillways. The next step is planting. Plants in a rain garden have several roles. The first is to hold the soil in place and prevent erosion with the root systems. The second is to help the water soak in. The roots keep the soil from becoming compacted over time and also create many small channels downward for water to travel. The third is to soak up and use some of the water themselves, thereby reducing the total amount. And finally, native plants in a rain garden provide habitat value for pollinators, birds, and wildlife. They also help make the rain garden beautiful. Our rain garden will use native plants that are indigenous to the Chesapeake Bay region for several reasons. First, native plants are adapted to the climate and soil conditions, so they can survive and thrive without irrigation or fertilization. Rain gardens should not be irrigated after the first year, once the plants are established. 
and they should never be fertilized as fertilizers are pollutants and we do not want them to be carried into our groundwater or streams. The second reason is that native plants provide the best habitat for the wildlife that is indigenous to our region. These plants and animals have been living together for thousands of years. It is best to purchase native plants from nurseries that specialize in them, of which there are several in our area. In addition to being native, the plants selected for the rain garden should be tough. Those growing on the slopes and berms should have extensive root systems that can hold the soil in place. And those growing in the basin must be able to tolerate both periodic flooding and extended periods of drought between storms. The plants immediately adjacent to the spillways should always be able to withstand moving water around their stems and roots. Because we care about habitat and aesthetics, we also select plants to ensure that there is something beautiful and interesting in the garden at every time of year. Our garden will have berries on troughs and seed heads on native grasses in the fall and winter, and flowers in spring, summer and fall. The final step of planting is adding mulch to stabilize and cover the soil while our plants establish themselves. This mulch needs to be aged, shredded hardwood bark mulch. Other types of mulch can float and be carried out of the basins when it rains. Planting densely minimizes future weeding and mulching. Over 700 plants were planted as part of this project. In addition to plants, there are areas of seeding. At the top and sides of the rain garden, we seeded lawn to allow people to walk around the perimeter. At the conservation landscape, we seeded some native grasses to stabilize the berms. The final step of seeding is to lay down erosion control blankets, which provide erosion control until the seeds germinate and the plants grow. We use Carlex Net Free, which is biodegradable and is not made of the plastic mesh that can be harmful to wildlife. Well, we're nearing the end of the construction and you might be wondering how water is going to get in. The entrance to our rain garden will be a curved cut, an opening along the curve that interrupts the flow of water down the side of the road and channels it into the rain garden. Another option for introducing the flow of water is a trench drain, a stormwater inlet and pipe leading to the rain garden. You can see a trench drain being used in a rain garden just up the hill here at Wooden Nature Sanctuary. A third way for water to enter is overland flow, which is when the topography around the garden is what directs the water into the garden. But for this particular rain garden, we went with a curb cut. A curb cut can be installed at the beginning or at the end of the construction process. In the case of our rain garden, the curb cut was made at the end. But we had to be careful. That's because although we now had a curb cut, we actually didn't want storm water flowing through the rain garden until the plants had time to become fully established. And this would take several months after they were planted. For this reason, we blocked off the curb cut with sandbags and plywood after installation. There, that should do it. Now, it was time to wait. Luckily, the Wooding Nature Sanctuary is a wonderful place to watch winter turn to spring. That's more like it. With the plants having established themselves, the rain garden was ready to be put online. So we had sandbag diversion and a piece of plywood in there to prevent the water from getting into the facility. So now that we have vegetation stabilizing the facility, we're able to remove that. So now, effectively, as of today, the facility is live and waiting for a rain event. One last step. 
and that's removing the silt fence, which was put in place at the start of construction to prevent runoff of sediment laden material. With this final step finished, Brad was able to reflect on the progress of the rain garden since winter. Well, from when I was here in January till now, I mean, everything's green and alive again. It was kind of barren when we were here to do the curb cut earlier this year. So, I mean, this is always the best time of year when everything kind of comes back to life, pops. It's colorful. We have grass coverage, plant materials in, everything's healthy. It's good to go. Good to go indeed. And on the next rainy day, the native plant rain garden went to work drawing in rainwater from the wooden sanctuary's driveway, soaking it up and reducing the quantity of water flowing into Rock Creek, a quarter of a mile away. Alice, gardens like this have so many benefits. Not only do they clean and soak up rainwater, reducing flooding, pollution, and erosion throughout our waterways, they can also be very beautiful and help wildlife. That's right, Gabby. And homeowners are growing more and more curious about how they can make a difference in the watershed with improvements to their own properties. Our hope is that you can take this knowledge of how to construct native plant rain gardens and bring it into your practice as landscapers. Let's build more native plant rain gardens! My favorite part about working in green infrastructure is in construction you spend a lot of time taking away from nature and this is a way to be involved in construction and actually give back a little bit. So um, what you see behind you with these rain gardens is something that Nature Forward is doing to collect rainwater and slow it down, take the peaks and valleys out of a rain event. And so these projects allow me to work in construction and um, benefit the environment at the same time.